Hey, New Life Church. This is gonna be great because over the next few weeks, we're gonna walk through the book of Philippians. It's one of my favorite books, mainly because it circles around this one word, joy. We've taught the church that joy is not happiness and happiness is not joy. Happiness comes from the root word happenstance, meaning where you are standing and what makes you happy. It's external from the outward features around our lives. That is not joy. Joy is internal. Joy is what is happening on the inside of you. You've got to know that. It doesn't correlate the happiness around us. And in fact, it overrides all of our life. It's the hack of discouragement, in my humble opinion, as we look at the word. For example, Paul wrote the book of Philippians that we're gonna study while he was in prison and while he was there. And you should study the prison he was in. History really tells the truth about that. But while he's there in this dungeon of a prison, he says in Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul had learned that in Christ, he could keep joy no matter what was going on around him. And again, all of this while he was in prison. And they could not, in all of his life, they could not discourage him after he met Christ. They said, we're gonna kill you. And he thought, good, I'll be with the Lord. Or we're gonna throw you in prison. Good, I need to write a letter to the people of Philippi. And that's why we're doing this book. It's incredible. Oh yeah, one last thought about Paul. Paul knew these people were losing their edge. He loved them. He knew that they were being persecuted and that they were facing heresy. And they had lost some unity too. You gotta be clear about that. So he gave them a huge truth bomb. Like He told them in Philippians 3.20, this will be helpful for all of us, but we are citizens of heaven. He was saying, look, you gotta see it this way. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. So he was trying to let them know, you are a citizen of heaven, you're not just on earth. That's a big thought. I did a series, it's so funny to talk about. I did a series once with the idea that we're not from around here in the book of Philippians. From that verse, we are citizens of heaven, not here. So to illustrate it, I went to the University of Arkansas, and I don't know if you ever heard of that place but I had my full LSU garb. I had the jerseys on, I had LSU flags around me, I had the hat on, I had LSU coffee mugs. So I got on the entrance sign to the university waving an LSU flag and let's just say I received a few gestures. I don't know if all this was legal or not, but we did it and we didn't get arrested. But who can blame them for being upset about that? Because I was, I was representing the wrong school. So I kept looking at the camera after I would do stuff like that. And I would say, I guess I'm not from around here. I went to Starbucks on the campus with an LSU mug and I just put it on the counter and I said, fill her up. And they looked at me, the looks were remarkable. And I just kept saying, I guess I'm not from around here. And this is what Paul is saying. We're not citizens of earth, remember, you're a citizen of heaven. He's basically teaching on having an eternal perspective. It's so important that we get that. So we're gonna go through the book of Philippians and I encourage you to sit down and read this book. We're gonna be teaching it and we'll show you exactly how to go about this. All of us in the same portion of scripture, statewide at all of our campuses. And you know what? I think we're gonna learn much just in the next few weeks. So here we go. Let's open up the letter right now. I told Rick when I saw this video, I said, here's my perception of this video. Jonah goes to Nineveh, stands atop famed landmark at University of Nineveh, holding banner that says, go Tarshish. <laughs> 39,000 Ninevites go to Jonah's church on Easter, Nineveh not smart. Okay, <laughs> so... I want you to go to uh, Philippians chapter 1 as we hop in today. If you've got your Bible, thank you so much for bringing that. It's been on my heart this week, for, or this year rather, for us to bring our physical Bibles to church. And so uh, thank you for, for doing that. Let me give you a little bit of back story or context on the book of Philippians. 
As Rick has said, this comes from the Apostle Paul, and this was written around 60 AD. So this is about 57 years post-resurrection. And Paul planted this church himself around 50 AD, which so the church has been in existence about 10 years. So about the length that our campus has been in this city is about how long the church existed. And so the audience is this specific church at Philippi. Now, one thing I think we have to not overlook when we think about reading the epistles is you have to realize when they were talking about the church at Philippi, that's exactly what they were talking about. There was a church at Philippi, a Christian church. It wasn't, you know, I told you last week, there are over 50 evangelical churches in our city limits alone. But Philippi, at this point in history, one Christian church. And so he writes them a a letter. It is a circuit letter that will be passed around, but it's very personal to, to them. And so Philippi was a miniature Rome, meaning that there was a large number of Roman citizens there. Most of his listeners were a very affluent crowd. They had made a lot of income in that particular area due to um, gold and silver mining. The purpose of this letter is actually a thank you. So as he's in prison and he's writing this, he is telling them, thank you for helping me out. Um, A man went and visited him while in prison, gave him some money, and Paul is thanking the church for sending this person to encourage him and provide a resource. So um, as I've already said, he is in prison, and it is a prison letter, as is Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon, all from prison. So here's the fascinating thing about these books is that Paul takes an attitude of turning his prison into a platform. So he speaks a lot in Philippians, and we're going to cover this in the next couple of weeks, about the difference between joy and happiness. So when he speaks of joy, he is speaking about something given by the Holy Spirit to you that is not attached to your circumstances. It is something that you possess because you are in Christ that you have this uncanny ability, you have a knack to have a life full of joy regardless of what's going on around you. So let's go to Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to read from the NLT today, but we're going to read one verse here. It's verse 27, Philippians 1 and 27, and this is what he says. Above all, now keep in mind, um, whenever a writer says this, they are trying to tell us, I've already said some things I want you to know, but this is the takeaway. So above all that I've said, I want you to get this part. He says, you must live as citizens of heaven. This means you got to take the perspective that this is a temporary life, that it's very fast, that our eyes need to be on eternity and on eternal things. He says, conduct yourselves in a manner that's worthy of the good news or the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together in one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news or the gospel. I want to repeat that one part. He says, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the the gospel. So there is a heart of Paul reaching out to this church that he's planted. It's very important to him. He's very connected to it. He is the founding pastor of Philippi. And he says, above all that I've said to you, above thanking you, above appreciating the resource, above the encouragement, what I want you to know about all of these things is I want you to be unified. I don't want you to be in dissension I don't want theology to split you. I don't want philosophy to split you. I don't want ideology to split you. I don't want Roman culture to split you. What I want you to do is stay together according to the gospel of Jesus. And I want you to be unified. One spirit. And 
And so it, it begs this question to say, well, then what would cause disunity among us? And I don't have time to, to start, uh, you know, creating questions about where we've all been. We're, we're a very young church, so this is not a generational church, meaning that all of us came here and did not grow up here. And so what, what have we seen through our church experiences over the years of our Christianity and our walk with Christ when it comes to disunity? What have you noticed that has divided God's church? Well, I'm going to give us just a few of those things, and then we'll dig just a little, little bit deeper. One of those primary reasons is people come to a church with differences, so they have things that they want to do that's just different. I can't tell you over the, the years how many people want to give advice to a church based upon just differences. Why do you dim lights? Why is, some, why is the volume up? Why don't you wear a tie? Uh, why, why don't we do church this way or that? Where are the altars? Where's the communion table? Um, where's this? Where's that? I want that. This isn't a church until that happens. And, and they, they bring their differences together and they're trying to worship the same God through the same theological grid, but they have differences and it creates some disunity. Now, Romans 15 and verse 5 through 7 says this, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So this tells us this. Again, this is something very important to Paul that we stay unified. He's saying, let Jesus get a hold of your differences. He's saying, lay those things down so that God can be glorified from the mere fact that you're in unity. That people notice and see you and understand that you're unified. That this is not a church, and I'm talking about capital C, of disunity. So there are differences. Then it goes a step further and people bring disagreements. And so sometimes people go, you know what? I just don't agree with that, so I don't think I can worship with you. And then they go into a very long process of what pastors call church hopping. So they go from one church to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, trying to find a group that they don't disagree with or that has people in it who they have ever disagreed with in life with. It's very, very difficult. I had a disagreement with my doctor this week. He weighed me and I said, that machine is a liar. <laughs> and then I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, I promise. He said, Kevin, I just want you to know the full armor of God is heavy. And I said, <laughs> I understand, Lord. I got it. Okay. Sometimes we, we disagree with each other. And I think what Paul is trying to teach us is it's all right. So you can have these differences and you can have these disagreements and don't let them divide you or create a chasm or keep you from worshiping or keep you from being in a life group together or serving alongside someone together, but you can have a difference and a disagreement. Something sometimes happens between us and someone else and we can't overcome it. It's like we get stuck in this angst. Okay, now we've all done it. You've done it. I've done it. It's like it never gets resolved. And we talk about forgiveness and we talk about being bitter and we talk about letting stuff go. But sometimes we have this situation where we, we just go, hey, this is, isn't resolved. And so there are disagreements and maybe it can be just one-sided. Um, what's odd is that sometimes we're upset with someone, they don't even know it. They don't, they don't even realize that something's wrong until we, you know, run into each other day, each, each other one day in, in one of our restaurants and, 
and one of them cuts their eyes or ignores them or whatever, and they go, I don't, I'm, that didn't feel good. I, don't, I, don't, I think something's wrong there. Sometimes we get nervous to confront a situation, so we settle for the assumption in our mind that, oh, I know why they're upset, and I know why this is happening, and I know what's going on, and we, we assume. And I will tell you that assuming is a slippery slope. Sometimes, and I, I told our staff this, I've noticed this about myself the past year, is that sometimes I lead by assumption. Like, I think that, that they think the way I think about a situation. And so I don't give enough clarity or enough direction about what I'm really wanting because I'm leading by assumption. I think they see it the way I do, or they, they would respond the way I would respond, mostly because we've been together for so long. And so I think they just think the way that I think, and that's not true. I do the same thing in my marriage. Sometimes I think Robbie just thinks the way I think. She does the same thing. There, there's an assumption that takes place there. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. How many of you enjoy when there's peace in your house? Just raise your hand. Like you enjoy when things are good, when they're sweet, when there's laughter, when there's not tension. You enjoy that. The house of God, of God is the same way. We enjoy being together in unity when there's no tension, uh, we, when, when we have a common mission and a common theme and we're doing things together and we're all coming from different backgrounds and experiences, but we've taken five fingers and made a fist and we're in unity together. The third thing, we, we can go from difference to disagreements to dislikes. And sometimes we just have these preferences and we want other people to like what we like. We pick our friends this way. We say, like, we have a lot of things in common. We like to travel, or we're, we're foodies, or we like watching film. And, and so you, you gather into groups based upon things that are common to you, and you enjoy it based upon these likes and dislikes. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, encourage us with, encourages us with this. He says, bear with each other, okay? This means... Have some patience. Get along with each other, okay? I think this is a very good way of, of what we would say in the South, grow up, okay? Bear with each other. Grow up. Forgive one another. Even if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So how do we fight for unity? This is where I want to spend my, my, my time today. Regardless of what story you bring to the church, this is still a 2,000-year-old challenge to the local body to have unity, and you and I need to hear it. And if you're here today and you feel like you've been on the receiving end of disunity, or you may feel like you're the person who's stirring things up. This sermon will address both parties today because we've got to, to discover how do we fight for unity? How do we worship beside someone that we may disagree with, that we have different likes and dislikes, but we serve the same God? So I want to tell, tell you something. This is going to be very hard for you, okay? I want you to think about someone right now that you don't agree with. If they're beside you, just look, look at me, okay? <laughs> no nudging, no elbowing. I want you to get that person in, in, in your mind, and I want you to think about it. Maybe, maybe it's been a heated disagreement. I want to tell you something that's very hard for us, us to hear, and here it is. Do you know that God is not against them? He loves them. He wants them in a, a, a local body. He wants them to be connected. He wants them in a life group. He wants them to serve him with their whole life. He wants to bless their marriage. He's got a dream for them. He saw them while they were in their mother's womb the same way he saw you. 
And so when you are praying against them, that is a prayer that is amiss. You're wasting breath and time because the Lord loves them. Very, very hard. I understand that. So here's the first thing about unity. We've got to understand that we have the same enemy. It's the same enemy. So, and, and it's, unfortunately, it's, it's not that person who you think it is. Ephesians 6 tells us strongly, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Everybody say flesh and blood. Okay, it's, it's, it's not against your, your neighbor or your boss or your, or your ex. Your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. And you go, man, that sounds like it's something that is spiritual and supernatural because it is. There is a spirit at work to divide you, to bring disunity, to separate churches. I've told you this before, but I was part of a, of a building program with a church before. We almost split, and I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I know sometimes I, I try to be funny, but this, I'm not trying to be funny here. We almost split over the color of carpet. I'm serious. Some people wanted this color. Some people wanted that color. Well, I'm not going to a church with that color carpet. So what, what we did, we put one color on one side. I'm, I'm kidding. We, we did the same color across, and we just let, let the, you know, everything fall. Paul is saying, listen, your fight is not against a neighbor. It's not against the person in the row ahead of you. It's not against your children. It's not against your parents. It's not against anybody in the world who's done you wrong. He's saying this disunity is a spiritual thing. And we have to address it in a spiritual way. How do we fight for unity? Have the same in enemy. Take what you have put onto someone else and begin to not pray against them, but pray for them, forgive them, and you aim all that towards praying spiritually against a spirit that would divide his church or divide your family or divide your friendship. You attack that thing in the spirit. Second, you got to have the same spirit, okay? It's, it's irritating. I'm going to try not to get on a, on a soapbox here this morning, but, you know, a lot of people try to use God for their opinion. So they'll say, I was praying and the Holy Spirit told me, but yet it doesn't add up to Scripture. So that tells me this. Either this Scripture is a, is a lie or you have not heard from the Holy Spirit, and so then, I, since I believe that the Bible is with, inerrant and infallible, I aim it toward the person. I say, I just don't think you've heard from God because it doesn't line up with what he's already told us. We have to have the same spirit. Philippians 1, 27, he says, I will know that you are standing together. And he uses this phrase with one spirit. I, I, I will know it. He says, when, when, you, when people walk into a church that's operating in one spirit in unity, the atmosphere is different. When that church culture is healthy by one spirit, it can be felt. It can be sensed. The next chapter of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 1, says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and being one of mind. Paul is saying this. Now keep in mind, he's talking to a Roman audience. He's saying, do not let a violent culture make you violent. Do not let a political culture make you filter God through politics. 
He's saying there, there is a God who loves and forgives and wants your company, and he wants you to be unified. And I would say the same thing to us this morning. Let's not let politics, culture, hot topics, social media, affluence or poverty, any of these things bring disunity into the body of Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. So let's live in, in, in unity. Now, here, here's something else. Unity does not mean uniformity. I'm not trying to say that we've all got to think the same way, believe the same way. I've told you many, many times one of the most beautiful things that I love about our church is it's eclectic is I love hearing all of your stories and your backgrounds. And, and we, we may disagree theologically, but that's okay. There's always been theological disagreements as long as we're on the same page as the essentials. We don't have to have the same personality to have unity. We don't have to separate all the extroverts and push them to an online service. We, 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 we don't have to take all, all the people that like this thing and get them in a life group together and silo every single person and hand out disc assessments and learn everybody's Enneagram number and start just, you know, prophesying in that way. Well, I know you're a seven, so you're not going to connect with a four, so what are we going to do? You know, we don't have to do those things. We don't have to split it out like, like that. Can you imagine walking in here and I had numbers everywhere based upon your Enneagram score and that's who you sat with? So your wife went over to the four and you went over to an eight and that's where you sat. You sat with all these different people. Maybe, maybe you want that. I don't know. The way you're responding, that might sound like a good idea to you. <laughs> but we don't have to have the same personality. We don't have to have the same style to have unity. Some of you love the look of our church. Some of you don't. It's because it's, it's a style issue. The, we, we don't have to have the same preferences. We don't have to necessarily agree on every point to have unity. When we have unity and Jesus at the forefront, our disagreements and dislikes become a secondary issue. Disunity form is, is when we take the dislikes and we take those and we let those be the tip of the spear and lead every conversation and every ministry and into every church and we go into every circumstance with the tip of our spear saying, this is what I, who I am and what I believe and I'm looking for people who believe the same thing. That, that, that is not going to happen. And it separates us. Even your spouse. There's some of you, your, your home is in complete unity, but you're different. One of you is hot. One of you is cold. My mother used to crank down the air conditioner in the house to the 60s. My dad would wear flannel pants to bed and put four blankets on there. They were hot and cold. Maybe somebody in your home wants to save and the other one wants to spend. You talk about vacations, one of you wants the mountains, one of you wants the beach. I've wanted the mountains for 10 years, but I got two girls, they both want the beach, they vote two against one, I just get to drive, that's all I do. <laughs> one of you wants tacos, one of you wants Chick-fil-A. I got news, today it's going to have to be tacos. Okay? <laughs> but that doesn't mean that your house is divided, Right? It just means that you're different. Church is the exact same way. So we're taking all these recipes, all these ingredients, and we're putting them together for one great outcome. And we sense that it's wonderful and it's good. And the reason it's good is because it's got many ingredients that come together and bring out a wonderful flavor of faith for all of us to experience. Third, we've got to have the same purpose. This is where we get into essentials and non-essentials. And this would be my encouragement to all of us. Keep the main thing the main thing. Can we do that? As a church, can that be part of our mission? Is let, let, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Let's keep Jesus the head of our body. Let's focus on him. Let's focus on eternity as Paul is teaching us and encouraging us. And he'll do it over and over in this book. Let's keep Jesus at the head. Let's follow him. The main thing, the main thing. Another way of saying that is let's major on the majors and keep the minors in the minors. All right? The biggest tension among Christians is this. 
we want to be right. I'm going to preach hard for just a minute, but I need you to stay, stay with me. I'm not against denominations, but I am saying that denominationally, how these began historically, whether it doesn't matter what my opinion is, history tells us this with great clarity. Denominations began as disagreements. So it's a group of people, one of them believes in one thing, one of them doesn't, so they say, I think this is where we, we part, and they become two different things. And that happened over and over and over and over again until we have what, what, what we have now. And many times this disunity that Paul is talking about has happened because we've spent years not trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we've tried to convince each other to join our team and we have fired from the high walls we've built toward each other and we take cheap shots at each other theologically. And I've said this before, but Satan doesn't care if you come to church. Because if he can disunify that church, it's ineffective anyway. It's not even a threat. If he can get us mad at somebody else and them mad at us, and then together we're also mad at somebody else, if he can get all 50 of our evangelical churches parted and disunified and upset at each other, it doesn't matter what, what, what we do because we're now focused on the war we've created among ourselves and our mission is now in second or third place. Keep the main thing the main thing. We want to be right. It's a little, little story. There was two fishermen in a river and they were, they were fishing and suddenly this, this little kid comes just down the river with a floaty on, and he's screaming, and he's screaming out loud, eternal security, eternal security. The fishermen are looking at each other, and they say, I think he's in trouble, let's, let's, let's get him, let's kid in a river, he's all by himself, and they snatch him, and they, they pull him to the shore, and he's just saying eternal security. Another kid comes down, down the river, and he's yelling out, spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts. Strange day on, on, on the water, right? <laughs> they grab the kid. And they're like, what is going on? They pull him to safety. The next one, there's, there's an, an, a third kid. He's coming down the river. Infant baptism. And they're talking to each other. And, and one guy says, I, I think we just need to stop fishing and wait on these kids and one guy says, no, I think I'm going to go up a river and figure out who's throwing these things in, the water. <laughs> I want to take that and plug it in for just a second because you and I, what we're doing is we are downstream from 2,000 years of theology. We are seeing in our river all kinds of thoughts and ideas and theology and teaching. And we've had 2,000 years since Paul wrote this letter to Philippi to stew on it and think about it and, 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 and banter and debate and argue and split and split again and so on and so forth. And Paul is so adamant about saying, stay together, stay unified, keep Jesus at the forefront of all that we're doing. And so if you're that person today, and I'm not trying to be hard, but if you're that person who is just bent on one piece of doctrine and you're like, this one thing would keep me from worshiping with you, you got to reevaluate that. you got to revisit that. 1 Corinthians 1 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord, that all of you agree with one another. In what you say, watch this, because this is hard, that there be no division among you. I don't need you to raise your hand or anything, but don't you think that's hard? You get a group of people together, and it's, it's hard. Three teenage girls can't even decide where they want to go eat for lunch today. Imagine putting together a whole group of people and saying, let there be no division among you. Watch. But that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. 
Whew, that's a lot. We could spend the rest of our days just working away, just, just honing this in. I want to be in unity with what the Spirit is doing. I want to be in unity. I want to be encouraging. I don't want to hold grudges. I don't, I don't want to be the person who is hung up on one thing, and because of that, I can't be in a life group or serve, serve a church, or I spend five years of my life going here, then going here, then going here, then going here. I can't ever plug in and connect and put, put roots down. I had a teacher one, one time that always said, RVs don't have roots. Be a tree, not an RV. Find a place. Bloom where you're planted. Serve it. Grow it. Get involved in, it, in its, its mission. So how do we apply this verse? Let me take just a few moments to wrap, wrap this up. Well, we're, we're, we do a lot of things, but we're, we're going to do this specifically in a few ways. Here, we pray for other churches. We try to let, let you know that we know we're not the only church. And that we're not mad at anybody. And that we want to partner with people. And if they're doing something good, that was a glass bottle there. If they want to do something good, then we want to get behind it. We don't have to fly the new life flag on everything. There are many things in this city where people do something better than we do, and we just help them. We just, we just resource it instead of trying to recreate it and say, well, we, we can be better at it than you, so we're going to be your competitor. No, we get behind it and say, let us help resource that and get it going. We want to encourage other people. I want to brag on Johnson for a second, our student pastor. Johnson this year had it on his heart. He wanted to connect with student pastors in this city, and he created a group where they meet every single week, different denominations, different cultures, different thoughts, different ideas, di di different leadership, but they stay to it. They do it every week. They, they pray for each other. They encourage. What is that? That's the church. And sometimes you have to help people find a church. This used to crack me up the very first time I heard him talk about it, but Craig Groeschel, when he started Life Church, it was in his garage at, at, at home. And they would just put metal folding chairs out and they would have church. And he had a little you know, room within his garage and they cleaned it out and that was their very first children's church. It was just a little, little room where like you and I would put a lawnmower. As you can see what's happened 20 something years later, it's exploded. God's really fav fav favored them. But what he used to do was occasionally he would have pictures and resources and phone numbers, and he would say, if you're here today and you think that I preach too long, here's a church in town. And he would show them the picture and the information, and he'd say, they, 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 they preach between 10 and 12 minutes. That might be the church for you. If you're here today and you think that we don't do enough worship, like you want to have like an hour of worship rather than 15 to 20 minutes, here's a church that worships for an hour. And he would direct them toward a church. The temptation oftentimes is to become all things for all people and you just can't do it. But I felt his heart behind it, whether you agree with that or not, it's irrelevant to, to the point. The heart was, I want to help somebody get connected to a church. In his final hours, Jesus prayed for our unity. And if you have your Bible, you can go to John 17. I'm going to read three verses here. He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. One of his final thoughts toward his future church was that we would be unified, that we would be together. 
And I read something this week, and I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna steal it, but just this little quote, and it was this. It was like in today's culture, when a pastor gets up in the pulpit and says, like, hey, you need to lock into a church. And you need you need you need to be there. And you need to serve and be in a life group and resource it and all those things. And everybody goes, no, wait a minute. I am the church. I don't need to go anywhere. I don't need to do anything. But if you flipped that context and if, if it was a coach, okay? So let's take Purdue, who's about to win the national championship. If that Purdue coach says, guys, I need you to be at be practice because it's important. It affects our team. It affects our, our, our mission. Nobody looks twice at that. You know what, what they say? I'll be there. We've got to make that shift in our minds to get that this is important. Christ died for it, gave his life for it, wants us in unity wants us together, wants us in one spirit, wants us to be missional together, wants us to plant other churches, wants us to raise up pastors. There is no reason at all. I've got a big vision in my heart that we haven't been able to, to do just yet. But we need to plant another church out of our church. We can only do that when everybody gets, gets, gets unified. Let the small things go. Can we just agree to do that together? I'm going to let all that go. I'm going to let a disagreement go. I'm going to let a dislike go. I'm going to let a preference go. Because I can promise you this, our heart is good. Our intention is good. What we want to do here is sacred and it's holy and it's meaningful. And I can just tell you from my perspective, if I, if I were not pastoring this church, I would still attend it. Because I believe in it. We always want Jesus to answer our prayers, but what if we could answer his? That we would be in, in unity. So that's how I'm going to end with it today. What is one step that you could take toward creating more unity? To let some, something go and step down away from it? To step up? to lead something new, to take on a challenge, to say yes to something, to make church part of your weekly worship, to call this place home and to be here? What do you want to do to create unity, to answer this prayer that Jesus prayed? Amen. Let's stand together. Father, I love you. I'm thankful for the house of the Lord. I pray today, God, for unity in your church. I pray that you bring us together like we've never been brought together before. And I pray right now, God, that we just, in this time of reflection, we would let things go. Lord, every disagreement, every dislike, every difference, God, we just let that thing go so that we can be perfectly unified in mind and thought. God, today we, we just reaffirm our love for the body. We reaffirm our love for each other. We reaffirm the mission of the local church, the mission that you gave your life for. So God, if there's something that any of us need to step away from and say, I'm, I'm going to let that thing go, we do it right now. We make a decision, a firm decision right now. I'm going to let it go. And God, maybe the, the best leader we've ever had is still just sitting out there somewhere in silence. God, would you just raise up leaders in this church? Raise up life group leaders, serve team leaders. People who believe this is their place. God, give us roots in this room today, God. And let us be in unity. God, may, maybe we need to find somebody today before we leave and just say, hey, forgive me. Will you just forgive me for the confusion? Will you forgive me? Hey, I think I've misunderstood you. Can we put this behind us? Let's just worship together. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. God, I pray your Holy Spirit just speak. What do you want from us? What do you want from us today, Lord? 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, we're about to worship the Lord one time. I'm encouraging you not to leave. Stick around for this. Let's worship. There's communion in the back and on the sides of the front. You can go and get communion, serve, serve your family, and let's just worship the Lord together. Let's ask him, what can I do to unify your church today? Amen. Let's worship him.